time, I want I need to ask you a question. Um, are you a member of the Bronco Underground? Um, the Bronco Underground. The Bronco Underground. <laughs> yes, I am a proud card-carrying member of the Bronco Underground. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't know we were called the Bronco Underground at the time, but I suppose I was a member of it, yes. Well, the first rule of Bronco Underground is you don't talk about Bronco Underground. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do. Talk about Bronco Underground. I'm Scenario Glinton, and this is Bring Back Bronco, the untold story. Now, we spent the first four chapters asking who killed the Bronco, but now it's 1996, and the Bronco has been replaced by the expedition. So I've got a different question to ask. If you love something enough, can you bring it back to life? Are there enough people and enough passion out there to bring Bronco back? Well, let's find out. When production of the Bronco was stopped in 1996, two things happened. Around the country, thousands of Bronco owners began coming together. They recognized that the 4x4s they were driving were now a part of history. This was the beginning of Bronco Nation. Now, at the same time, inside Ford, a clandestine movement called Bronco Underground was formed to bring it back. This is Chapter 5, Driving in the Dark. It's the call of the wild. Ford Bronco. With a heritage of proven dependability. A do-anything workhorse. It's a brand new kick. Perfect for those off-road ups and downs. V6 power no competitor can touch. You're ahead in a Ford Bronco. Bronco, 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 Bronco. Does anyone remember the A-Team? Dun, 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 dun. You know, a crack commando unit, they escaped into the Los Angeles underground. If you have a problem, if no one else can help you, maybe you can hire the A-Team. God, I love that show. Mr. T, George Prepard. this is great 80s television. Not really, but the secret to their success is that they worked without rules. They didn't wait for permission from their superiors. They just acted. And as a result, they were able to get things done. The A-Team was the ultimate skunk works project. In that way, they had a lot in common with the Bronco Underground. But remember how Hannibal would always say, I love it when a plan comes together? Well, in that respect, the Underground was a little different. Did you have a strategy or a f- like of how to... How to bring it back? Uh, yeah, why not? Yeah, did you? Not really, to be honest. That is Mark Gruber. We tried to come up with different plans, but I don't know if I would really call it a strategy. I think it was just, we're going to keep pushing on it and try to figure out how to make it happen. Mark is going to be a really pivotal character in this story, so you should probably get to know him a little bit. Right, right, right. Yeah, I like some of the, you know, I like to rock to some ACDC for a couple of their songs or whatever. Mark comes across as a teenager, trapped in a grown man's body. He walks the way high school kids do. You know, he doesn't really carry himself like a regular Detroit executive. He's a jeans and t-shirt kind of guy with the ever-present Ford merchandise. Today, it's a Bronco t-shirt. I would say I dislike minivans just because it's got no personality. It's just so practical and functional. I just feels like you're just driving a box around. For Mark, working at Ford is a family thing. Uh, So I'm actually a fourth generation, believe it or not, at Ford. Um, Second here. There you go. So I had uh, both my parents work for Ford. My grandfather started out and they had a trade school and he worked his way up at Ford uh, through that. He worked for a short period of time directly for Henry Ford. Do you you know that you're going to go in the auto industry or did you fight it? No, I, I, that's what I always thought I was going to do. That's what I always wanted to do. Just felt natural I was going to go work for Ford, just like you know my brother had and my parents had. And uh, coming out of undergraduate, there was a bit of a recession at the time, and I couldn't get a job with Ford. I got like turned down like four times. What and, year is that? What recession? Uh, that would have been um, like 1990. 
So it was really disappointing at the time that I couldn't get a job with Ford. So then I had to change plans and I went to work for a bank for four years. But Mark, as I'm sure you've guessed by now, is not really the banking type. And then I went back to grad school after that and Ford was interviewing on campus um, at grad school. And I was like, all right, I'm going to give it one more chance here. And maybe it's not to be, but it worked out from there. For him and for the Bronco. Now, where were we? Right, 1996. As soon as Bronco went away, there was a group that was just super passionate about what does it take to convince leadership to try to develop the proposal, whatever we have to do, let's try to bring Bronco back. To be clear, Mark wasn't the leader of this group. There really wasn't one. There's no formal membership to Bronco Underground. It's I would describe it more as just a commitment of uh, who's ever involved in that to be passionate and do whatever they can to try to get Bronco back. He worked on the Bronco at night, on weekends, on his lunch hour, really whenever he could push his real work to the side of his desk. The underground would meet in the cafeteria or maybe chat in the elevator. Sometimes it was just the nod during a meeting. It would be like, hey, you know, look, let's look how popular the competitor products are doing. Or, hey, there's, um, you know, some more research kind of saying the values of the old Broncos are going up. Whatever that type of info, it would just kind of fire up the individuals to say, see, we should be doing the Bronco. Underground members were sprinkled throughout the company. One of them was Tom Patterson. And there was this passion about the people that got together. And just like the A-Team, they were an odd collection of characters. There was the MacGyver who understood how to engineer what it would take to get a legit off-road vehicle. Then there was kind of the brains who knew, ah, okay, we can build it at this plant, and this is how much it's gonna cost, and this is the fuel economy target we're gonna have to meet. The customer, that was me, that was my skill set of what I brought was customer uh, insights. And then we had a studio person. I refer to them as the sketcher. (laughs) <laughs> the sketchers would, you know, they were they were doing stuff. So, I mean, you had a pretty good cross-section of people. All those people had full-time jobs where they had to answer to their bosses, but things were different on the Bronco. It was freedom. There was nobody telling us, oh, you know, you got to go to this executive or you got to go to this meeting. It was just like, no, no, we're going to get together on our free time and we're going to make a, a paper that says you should do this. And Here's all the extensive thought as to why and how. Typically kind of be almost like, can you kind of do this, you know, on your lunch hour? Can you do it after hours? Um, But you are using Ford resources to kind of do that. Um, So might be frowned upon, but, um, you know, I think there was just so many people with such passion um, that kind of wanted to make it happen. The underground's first goal proved there was demand for a new Bronco. Now, if they built it, would anybody buy it? Well, the proof was found hiding in the foothills of East Tennessee. I've owned big Broncos, little Broncos, tall Broncos, short Broncos. Tom Broberg is, was, and will always be a diehard Bronco fan. My daughter has an early Bronco. My son has an early Bronco. My other son has a full-size Bronco. So uh, my, my parking lot, my driveway has always been full of Fords. By the late 90s, all those Broncos were orphans, abandoned by their maker. You know, we were having a little bit of uh, missing it. So we had to do something to help keep our blood blue and keep that Bronco enthusiasm going. And a community needs a shared history, stories and rituals that bind them. So Broberg decided he would become the teller of those stories. And me and my wife, Donna, we started Bronco Driver Magazine. Quite laughed at by the crowd when uh, we started a magazine dedicated to just the uh, Ford Bronco. To be clear, it was the magazine crowd that was laughing. The Bronco crowd loved it. 
We feature great stories, great people. We've developed a, quite a following. I call it a, a cult following of uh, Bronco enthusiasts that uh, love, eat, breathe everything Ford Bronco. Now, of course, the magazine eventually wasn't enough. So they started organizing events, meetups, group drives, and eventually week-long celebrations. So uh, if you go to one of these events, you're going to find people that have the same interest as you do. And you're probably going to have 30 vendors selling parts. Uh, You're going to have a bonfire at the night. You're going to have all sorts of camaraderie and entertainment going on. It's crazy how similar brain patterns people have, regardless of where they live in the America, where regardless of their socioeconomic status, regardless of their political, you know, affiliation. They all love each other, they all get together, and it's all based on the Ford Bronco. At the East Tennessee event, you'll find 600 Broncos sharing a field. Some of them have guitar racks in there. Some of them have gun racks. Some of them have no tops. Some of them have roll bars. You, you know, I don't know the mathematics of the lottery, but the mathematics of the what you could do to a Ford Bronco would probably uh, challenge the number in which a lottery is, you know, million to one different looks. These parties are for hardcore Bronco fans only. You aren't allowed to bring any other vehicle onto the grounds. So if you're a vendor selling t-shirts and you want to bring your stuff in a minivan, sorry, well, they would say sorry. Anyway, you'll have to park it on the road and walk your stuff in. You'll see what's called the slow crawls. We'll line Broncos up and see who can race across the finish line the slowest, which is, uh, you know, they, these, these guys have them geared down and double transfer cases in there. And it's just kind of fun to take a new twist on an old thing. A new twist on an old thing applies to the owners, too. It used to be your farmers that would come out, you know, with their overalls. Now you're getting to see a little bit more of the penny loafers and, you know, the the Izod shirts. So it, there has been a transformation in the last 18 years, um, which is a good thing. You always have to have new blood for an old thing. I've been to a lot of auto shows, and this isn't a typical auto show, and it's definitely not a beauty pageant. It's not just sitting around with a diaper, wiping your car, you know, if somebody breathes on it. They actually take them out. We use them in the national park. There'll be destination drives to lost cities. Um, And and it just gives the Bronco community a, a good excuse to come to the Smoky Mountains. Okay, so driving in the backcountry in trucks that are pushing 50 years old, guess what? Things break carry a half inch wrench and just about go anywhere you know uh, uh, and and the old carburetors it was just spark gas and you're you know you're you're going but if something broke you know we'd be fixed in a, an hour and back on the trails without having to have a computer so yeah that is a lot of the allure still today on all their drives there is one place they don't go Just 20 miles away is the Alcatraz East Crime Museum, home to the white Bronco from that famous 1994 police chase. Actually, we drive right by it on some of our drives. You can see the crime museum as we drive by. And I've never seen anybody pull off and stop to just see that Bronco. It's just not something that, um, you know, it's just pretty standard Bronco for one thing. But it's not, you know, they they rather look at something cool than something uh, with, with that kind of history on it. Campfires and drives in the Smoky Mountains are awesome. But are they enough to compel Ford to revive the brand? Well, not in the short term. It's the late 90s. Mark Gruber and his friends are working late, sketching trucks, trying to figure out costs. Meanwhile, the success of Tom's Magazine and dozens of fan groups that grew into Bronco Nation have clearly shown that people are still in love with the Bronco. So now the underground has a new goal. When you're trying to change the direction of the battleship here, that's really freaking difficult to do because you're needing to convince not only, you know, your peers and the people in the other groups, but you're needing to convince all their leadership because that's who they're taking direction from. 
to get their ideas taken seriously, look, they needed a champion, an executive with enough clout to smooth the way. These guys needed a godfather. At the top of the house, it just, you know, there was not a lot of love for it. And, you know, it just frustrated the heck out of myself and others to say, we don't get it. Why, why are we not bringing this product back? It makes all the sense in the world to us. One explanation is that these executives they're trying to convince, in many cases, are the same people that had killed the Bronco in the first place back in 1996. You're almost asking them to say, hey, something's changed or the decision we made before is wrong. Now, those executives, they saw things just a little bit differently. The underground is trying to revive a brand that was created for freewheeling 60s. They're talking about sunny skies, fresh air, the wide open road. But that's not exactly what Ford honchos were seeing as they were driving home from Dearborn through Detroit and its suburbs, especially in the late 1990s. At that point, a Detroit native-born son, a lawyer, Dennis Archer, is elected mayor. That's Bailey Sasoy Moore. She's my guide to all things Detroit. He inherits a mess. Smallest population in 60 years in Detroit. We're under 600,000 people, making us the only American city in the country's history to have a population over 1 million fall below 1 million. We have a public school system that used to be one of the finest in the world that is now struggling even to stay off the top 10 worst list. We've got huge deficits. City taxes aren't being paid. Our water is the highest in the nation. Every we time are, you say this, I, I, I want to go hard times. Hard times, yeah. It <laughs> was it was bad. And there, there's no sugarcoating that. Was good stuff happening? Yes. Was the Detroit Institute of Arts the fourth largest art museum in the country and doing amazing exhibits? Absolutely. But was stuff bad? Feet on the ground? Was it hard to be a Detroiter? Absolutely. I remember there was a slogan. What what is it? Stand up and tell them you're from Detroit. Is that the one? Yeah, but part of the slogan was, when you travel, say nice things about Detroit. And I remember people thinking, we're broke. We're not traveling anywhere. (laughs) Where do you think we're going to, like, spread the Detroit gospel? But there was this real chip on our shoulder. Because Detroit was feeling, in a lot of ways, like we got used. Like we were there when everyone needed us. But now greener pastures and they left. That is a tough environment to gather support for bringing back a fun, summertime, get-out-in-nature kind of truck. New Year's Day 2000. We all woke up that morning to a new millennium and to a huge sigh of relief that Y2K hadn't actually crashed all our computers. Right around then, deep inside of Ford's top-secret design studios, the underground started something new. Well, we thought, well, let's, let's, let's do a Bronco. And there was many iterations of Bronco in the past where we sort of decided to really pick on what we thought was the, the original Bronco and, and, and be true to that. So, That's Maury Callum, a visionary in the car design world. He was also a member of the Bronco Underground. I grew up in Scotland, and uh, uh, I probably didn't see a Bronco until I was in my 20s, I imagine. But, and, I, and I think it's always a case of you, 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 you sort of lust after what you can't get, as it were. And so he made his own, codename U260. We did a four-door hardtop, and we did a two-door convertible. It was bright red. It's, it's sort of it's, it's it's inspired by '66. Very simple, very planar body side, very clean, but, but uh, and very utilitarian in a way, I would say. To my taste, because I'm an early Bronco fan, uh, it was a, a very attractive SUV, very reminiscent of the early Bronco. Um, it looked stunning. That's Robert Parker. Yep, the same Robert Parker that was a supervisor in the call center on the night of the OJ chase. Well, it's now a decade later, and he's in Ford's product planning division. It was designed and essentially ready to move into the engineering phase. And it was a good time to be designing SUVs. Every division within Ford was working on them. Plus, they had just spent $2.8 billion to buy Land Rover, the premier luxury brand for off-road trucks in Europe. Well, we had a, a, a huge research event in California, I remember, and we had 
SUVs from Ford, Lincoln, Mercury, Land Rover, Volvo, all lined up. It was supposed to be a celebration of the future of the company. But seeing them all together in one place gave a very different impression. You know, when you looked at it, you did have to kind of step back and go, is that too many SUVs? Ford owns so many brands, they were in danger of cannibalizing their own business. There was a lot of debate around what the heck, you know, are we doing with an SUV at Mercury? Shouldn't we take SUVs out of Mercury's lineup? And does Lincoln need an SUV if we've got Land Rover and Volvo? Now, all of those brands had established reputations in the market. Land Rover in particular was a premium name that Ford had just invested a pile of money in. And then the U260 was something new and unproven. And it was the company's view at that stage that we had too many SUVs and um, needed to not have another SUV in the stable. And uh, so Bronco um, was the one that was canceled. That was the end of the U260. Now that bright red model was rolled into a storage garage and covered up with a gray sheet. Maury Callum was heartbroken. Mark Gruber was gutted. He closed up the file, put it on a shelf, and focused on his day job. But the Bronco Underground works in mysterious ways. You see, there are about 20 members of this group spread over a corporation with 200,000 employees. They didn't all know what the others were doing. Welcome to the 2004 Detroit Auto Show. Now it starts with the most ridiculous video I've ever seen. There are stars and planets swirling around through space, and then the camera zooms into planet Earth. Now the animations look really cheesy because, you know, it's 2004. There's snow-covered mountains, and then there's this silver 4x4 rolling down a dirt road. Firefighters are all around, battling the blaze in the forest. A burning tree falls across the road. And through it all, the truck races along until it comes to a stop at the top of a hill. Smoke, or maybe there's clouds, are swirling around. And when the screen is lifted, there it is. A Bronco. A real, full-on, functional concept car. It was the first real Bronco that Ford had built in eight years, and it was beautiful. I'm going to tell you there was a lot of blood going through my head because I was standing on it. I was so excited. The auto show was held in January, but for Bronco fans like Tom Broberg, it was Christmas. It was a good-looking silver Bronco, and it was cut to the cloth of the early Bronco, the, you know, the Gen 1, 66 to 77. It kind of made us feel like it's going to make our Bronco world grow. The Detroit Auto Show ran for 10 days. Hundreds of thousands of people stopped by to stare at the new Bronco. And in April, it wowed a whole new audience at the auto show in New York City. It was like a mythical beast. A brand that had been out of the market for almost a decade had now suddenly reappeared. Then, nothing. Bubkiss. Weeks, months, nothing. A uh, year later, you know, nothing happened. What happened? Where did it go? Uh, you know, the, the enthusiasm was at its peak and Ford was nowhere to be found. Bronco Nation had questions. Lots of questions. Whether they were going to do it, whether they were not going to do it. You know, they had taken the Bronco out to uh, around the country to a few shows. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like a crescendo and then boom the orchestra quit they got up and left and there was a we were all just kind of shaking our head where did they go it was something that we never got answers to and and to this day i still don't know whatever happened uh, as paul harvey said i don't know the rest of the story i think there's a fair amount of people that simply gave up that's robert parker you know some of those 
diehard Bronco enthusiasts just resigned themselves to the fact that Ford wasn't going to do this. So they just resigned themselves and went and bought a Jeep. That was the biggest fear for the Bronco Underground, that people would just forget about the brand and drift away. If the passion dissipated, then the chances of reviving the truck would also disappear. Unless, of course, they could find a new group of people to embrace the Bronco identity. You know that saying, what goes around comes around? Well, it does. Remember those whiny kids in the back seat, the teenagers demanding their own doors? The demographic boom that forced automakers to switch from two-door trucks to four-door models? Well, those millennials are all grown up now, and Ford wants to sell them a new truck. That is the next chapter of Bring Back Bronco, the untold story. I'm Sonari Glinton. I'm not a millennial, but you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen. <laughs>